Um, anyway, let me introduce Tom Fletcher. Uh, Tom is an associate professor at the Department of ECE and Computer Science at the University of Virginia. Uh, long ago, well, not that long ago, he was uh, on the faculty of the Computer Science Department at the University of Utah. And long, long ago, he, he was a doctoral dissertation advisor here under me uh, in, uh, in, with a dissertation in the area of shape statistics. Uh, and he today is going to uh, give a lecture on manifold statistic shape analysis. And I am sure you will enjoy it. I certainly will. So let me pass the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'd say uh, it's a real honor to come back uh, and give a lecture here on uh, the class. I thank you for the invitation to do so. Um, everything I know about shape, I learned from Steve. He's the reason I'm in. Uh, shape analysis uh, to this day, so um, this is real honor. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to talk about talk about as you said, manifold uh, statistics uh, and shape analysis. Okay, and mostly I'm going to talk about regression analysis today, depending on how fast things go. Um, I should say, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions as we go along. Uh, and so, um, as you can see, we've got half a dozen people on Zoom. Yeah, Zoom people also feel free to jump in and ask a question. Um, so, yeah, so uh, regression analysis. So, I mean, we're all familiar with the basic idea of regression analysis is real valued. Uh, Data. I have two variables, an uh, independent variable x and a dependent variable y, and I want to know that dependence to the x y. Um, and I'm thinking of this as a function. You see it on the right. Uh, you know, the y variable is equal to some function f of x uh, of noise. Um, and I have a picture like that on the left. And so this is very classic stuff. But then they get a lot more complicated when I don't have numbers or, or vectors, uh, even. Um, sorry, I know I need to do that. Far right on the, on the bar, on the black bar, away far, even farther than oh, the I edge of the screen. I see. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I want to do the, the sound is muddled. I don't know. Oh, okay. It's maybe my mic is, is it better if I move the mic down or up? Is it, is it sound better now? People on Zoom. I can't move it on. Or it can reload Zoom now. A bit better. A bit better. It's not yeah. a lot. Okay. Let me ask, is it better if I have the mic like right in front of my mouth? Is this better? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check the, uh, the, um, it might be a bad, a bad one. I don't know if it's, there's three, it's three, I guess it's okay. So um, I will talk as loudly and clearly as I can. Hopefully this will be good enough. Well, but this is important for the recording, oh, so that's it's not good enough. Just manage. Um, you want to go get Renee and pick it? Yeah, figure out what to do. Yeah, they can't hear this. Let me see if I can 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 hear this. Oh, okay. Someone said they hear me just fine. The battery's fresh. I think that's probably the Renee saying that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I, maybe I can keep going. Um, okay. And again, I'll, I'll try to talk loudly and clearly as possible. Hopefully, this might be okay. Um, so, yeah, so then um, in more interesting 
data analysis problems, we don't have just scalar values or vector, using vector values, uh, random variables that we're interested in understanding relationships between. We have things like images, um, we have shapes, which is the topic of this course, course, and um, we have things like graphs or networks. Uh, all of these things um, are not easily represented uh, with just vectors or lists of numbers. Uh, they have some other structure to them, um, which is often nonlinear, uh, and and that's where the manifold geometry can be useful to analyze these types of objects. Okay, and so I know you know the answer to this question on this slide. What is shape? Because you've been in this uh, course for about a half semester already. Um, but I'll just give you um, my my usual spiel about what is shape mathematically. Um, so if you think of uh, these uh, fish uh, objects. Uh, they all have the same shape. Um, I know because I drew them and I just rotated and translated and scaled the same fish object. Um, so, so the point is that shape is geometry, but it's a geometry that's left over when you disregard uh, uh, position, orientation, and size of the object. So if you think of a modulo or, or, or removing somehow the, that information, the geometry you have left over is what we call shape. Um, and again, as you learned in this class, there's lots of ways to represent this geometry, um, which includes the rotation translation scale. You can use point point um, um, models. I, I hear you learned it already. Um, continuous representations, whether they're in some kind of basis, typically Fourier basis or polynomial line, things like this. Um, and I know you're learning a lot about medial or skeletal. Um, uh, representations of the solid interior of, of objects as well. And these are all ways we can represent the geometry. Um, and even when we have things that are linear, uh, at, at the geometry is linear in the case of like points or Fourier bases, um, you can think of it as a vector space representation of the geometry. It's still the case when you remove translation, rotation, scalar effects, you end up with a, um, a nonlinear representation. Um, and I think you, you heard about in the boundary point or landmark case, when you remove those effects, you get um, Kendall shape space, which is a, a spherical type uh, manifold, a complex projective space. Um, and then the last example I'll mention of, of shape representation uh, is transformation models. Uh, this is dating back to 1917, Darcy Thompson. I uh, had this idea that we can represent the differences in shapes uh, between objects um, just by looking at uh, some mathematical warp or transformation between the objects. And then you can actually throw away the objects themselves and just study the differences in the, in the warp and the transformation. Um, and that's where you have all the shape information encoded. Um, and in today's world and medical imaging analysis, there's a whole lot of digimorphic image registration where we study the digimorphic. Um, uh, transformations uh, statistically rather than the images themselves. Once you can align geometry uh, with all the, the shape information encoded with the transformation. As I just review all this stuff basically because I'm going to be talking about um, some, give some examples of some statistical analyses. Now we're using uh, either Kindle shape space uh, representations or um, digimorphic transformations, but I won't give you a map of those things. I think you're learning. Um, a lot of that here in other lectures. Okay, but the point um, is that in the end, uh, we, uh, no matter what geometry representation we use, we um, are going to think of our shape data, uh, our objects being represented as points in some eye-dimensional nonlinear manifold, we'll call it shape space, or that Kendall shape space, or digimorphism, or skeletal representations. Um, they all live on a manifold where points on the manifold represent an entire uh, uh, shape of an object. And um, now I want to do statistics on this nonlinear manifold. It doesn't, I can't do, um, you know, Y equals uh, some matrix times a vector X uh, plus noise. I can't do that linear model of that linear regression model anymore because there are no vector space operations. I know you're worrying about spherical data, um, to skeletal representations and then Kendall shape space. Um, and the point is that you can't add two points uh, on a sphere and get another point on a sphere. So we lost the vector space properties of the ambient Euclidean space. Um, but when we do have 
um, is uh, geodesics. Uh, so we, the one tool we have left still is this notion of distance between two points. So if I have an X and a Y point, two shapes, um, I can't add those or, or detract them to get a difference, but I can find the geodesic um, shortest path between X and Y. Um, and I can talk about how similar those shapes are by the length of that geodesic. And that's really the main tool. And, that, and, and um, most of, or I should say, a lot of statistical analysis can be generalized as just as you have that one tool, that geodesic uh, um, computation. And again, I think you've learned this uh, from what I thought of the students already covered. Um, you know, we talked about uh, what the geodesic you learned on the manifold, the shortest uh, path, uh, shortest curves on your manifold, and then the main tool uh, to, to kind of um, do computations now is what's called the exponential map. Um, and this is just review what you've already seen before. Um, is if I have a point C on uh, my manifold, and I have a tangent vector capital X at that point E, then the exponential map, uh, you know, so the exponential T X um, returns a point on the manifold, which is along the geodesic segment with start point T and start direction or tangent velocity X, um, and the length of the geodesic segment from T to the output of the exponential map has the same length as the tangent vector X. So that's the key ingredient. Like the, you have this um, preservation of length, uh, this, this length is given by the Riemannian metric of the tangent vector X and the length of the geodesic segment that will T to X, uh, X uh, geodesic segment has the same length. Okay. And um, so we can use that. If you can compute that on your uh, shape space, your manifold, then you can do a lot of uh, um, the exponential map has an inverse process called the log map. Um, and here I leave two points T and Q. Now in the manifold, you invert that process and recover the tangent vector in the tangent space of T and recover the X. That would be the exponential map uh, we're getting back to Q. Um, and then, and the, the nice thing about the log map is that um, I need to do geodesic distances. If I have a log map, then the geodesic distances just become a log map and then uh, take a norm of the vector. And that uh, tells me the geodesic distance between T and Q. Okay. Um, right. So, with that kind of background set up, I'll start um, talking about how we do regression uh, models on uh, manifolds. And it's really cool for any, any manifold you can do geodesic or log map, exponential map one. But specifically for this for this class, um, shape shape spaces. So um, so why is regression important? And and uh, this is again uh, kind of a medical uh, uh, or uh, biological question. Is we want to understand how does anatomy change over time? Um, and this could be this could be development, uh, could be aging. Um, it could be called a disease process changing the shape of the anatomy. We want to understand how a shape evolving over time. Um, and so this is an example of uh, um, uh, some, some MRI data, just mid-axial slices from a 3D MRI study of aging, uh, healthy aging. And so this is ranging from age 20 to 80 years old. Um, I can't remember. I don't know how fast people can count. I think this might be all 100 subjects listed here. I don't remember if I have exactly all 100. Um, but uh, but you know that they're they're sorted. Uh, so the top left corner is in their early 20s, and the bottom right corner is um, you know going left to right and top to bottom, getting older down to the the 80, um, roughly 80 years old at the bottom right corner. And so um, the point I'm uh, going to make is that you know just looking at this. It's hard to distinguish a pattern, like how how are people range different from the younger people moving down to the older uh, folks. Except for the fat ventricles. Yeah, the ventricles. If you if you have a keen eye, but even that, I, I find hard to pick out just from the key of images. But it is the case, and you'll, you'll see this in the regression we've already seen alluding to that the ventricles get larger as we get older. Um, and but but to really see this pattern, is the pattern there or not? Um, will the shape change? We really need a regression model. Um, and I, I will say here, the, the regression problem is X, the independent variable is time or your age. 
And then the response, the Y variable, the dependent variable is shape, is, is the brain image or brain shape. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, and so, so the more general problem is that you just have some X values um, that are paired with Y values. And again, this is in our brain samples, age and, and shape is Y. Um, and, and so, but the given more generally uh, real values and, and, and manifold values uh, in pairs, um, we have the following setup. So again, I'm, I'm going to draw, I should have mentioned this throughout the talk, you see a little kidney bean shape, that's the manifold. Um, so, so M is this manifold over here, like our shape base, and we have a bunch of data here. Um, each data has a, you can call it like a label, like their age is, is just the X, the, the real value. Um, and uh, in my cartoon example, I'm going to think of fish if I wanted to study fish shapes. Um, and I might want to know how does uh, how does fish change as they get older? Um, this is like a big cartoon, not any uh, resemblance to real data at all. Um, but but you know the, the, the question you'd be asking is how does fish change as they get older, or more generally, um, how does the x variable explain the y variable? Um, and so you can think, I like to think of it in kind of two different uh, perspectives. One is, um, like you saw the picture of, you know, regression function or, or real numbers. You can think of that as the regression function now is, um, if the input is X and the output is manifold value, that means you have a curve on the manifold. Okay, so as X changes, uh, F of X will be this curve. Uh, one, one, you have one parameter, so it's a one-dimensional curve on the manifold. Um, presumably, it's going to be continuous and probably differential as well. Um, but then if I think of it in terms of uh, that, that curve, because as I move along the shape space, every point is a unique shape. So what the curve represents is um, F of X is a moving kind of uh, shape uh, or a changing a shape that changes with X. If I change X, the shape changes. So this would be like the average fish as you get a certain age of fish. Okay. Um, and then, uh, like the, the next thing we can think of is in, in, in standard statistics, you can more or less break down regression problems into two different categories. You break them into lots of different categories. But here's a useful split is between uh, parametric models. So the F, the function, um, has some parametric form, like the, the, the uh, function, like a linear function or polynomial function. Um, and then non parametric regression models where um, you don't have a, um, uh, a simple, really I should say, you don't have a, a, a simple parametric form. Um, and, and you do things like kernel regression where you are simply going to move the average, a uh, sliding window average um, with some kernel, uh, with the average nearby point to get um, with um, regression relationship. And so we're going to look at how to do that, both of these types of regression models, but then again, the output is a manifold value y. Okay, so um, just to review, like linear regression in the Euclidean case, and now um, we're doing multiple linear regression. If we, we have to be really careful because very often we'll do multivariate regression where the input is multivariate and the output is scalar. We're kind of flipping that on its head, but, and we're doing, to, to match the manifold case, the output is high dimensional thing. So, so here, um, our function f in the, in the linear case would be uh, going from one dimension x's to um, n dimensional uh, y's. Um, so we have a, a, a model that looks like the following: um, f of x, x is a random variable. Uh, uh, you know, um, the real value is alpha plus x beta, and the alpha and beta are, are n dimensional vectors. And there's a there's a parameter, so it's like a um, like I said it here. Uh, no, I don't say that here. Um, the the a alpha is like the intercept, and the beta is like the slope, but they're multivariate intercepts and slope. Um, and yeah, and so the regression problem is so the y, the alpha is there with like that relationship um, plus noise, where we usually assume Gaussian. Um, and yeah, the, and now the key point that we want to now take to manifolds is to generalize this setup um, is how do you then uh, do the actual uh, estimation problem. And what we do typically is we, um, again, if you know, assuming bouncing noise, normal distribution uh, uh, up on there, 
um, the maximum likelihood estimate is to do the least squared problem, as we know. Um, and so I want to minimize the square to error between my y output and this linear model alpha plus x beta. Um, I want to minimize the difference, square difference, the residual error to be zero. Um, and sum that up over the uh, full sample of data. Okay, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing a minimization, I should say, over the parameters with, you know, intercept alpha and the slope data. Okay, so, so this is what we want to generalize. Uh, Linear regression, we want to move this over into the case of manifold. And of course, the biggest problem is we don't have lines, so there's no such thing as a linear uh, function uh, typically that's generally on a manifold. Um, but again, we do have geodesics, they're kind of the generalization of, of, a, of a straight line to our manifold, or so I should say, with a Riemannian manifold. And so that's what we're going to use in place of the line to intersect the square of alpha beta. Um, we're going to now try to fit a geodesic curve uh, to our data, um, our xy data. And so again, we'll think of an intercept and slope. Um, the intercept, uh, so we're going to uh, fit a geodesic curve, I should mention, uh, gamma um, from uh, some range. You can just hit zero to one, or you can like even age, you might be friends by that. But um, we'll start with uh, initial condition. The intercept is the initial condition to get that to get the line. I'm getting an automatic shutdown in two minutes. Is this thing really going to stay on? <laughs> you can just feel it. You uh, it says press here, but this means press here. Yeah. Okay. That should stay on. Sorry, good enough. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so the intercept now, uh, remember for a line for linear regression is where it's it, 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 at x equals zero. The same thing here, where's our geodesic at time zero? Um, that's our intercept. And again, that's going to be a point on the manifold. And then the initial velocity of that geodesic is the equivalent to our slope. How fast is that geodesic moving um, at time zero? Okay. And so you get the initial to gamma zero. Um, gamma time being first the ratio of gamma at time zero, there's going to be some velocity T. Um, and it turns out that at least for some time, uh, this uniquely determines the geodesic. It's unlike lines, lines are guaranteed for all time to, to keep going forever. Uh, geodesics are at least um, guaranteed to exist um, and be unique with given initial conditions, at least for some short time. Um, but, but yeah, so, so given these initial conditions, the intercept and slope, we do have a geodesic, uh, uh, so this is a, a way to randomize geodesics that we want to fit to the data with your team and the Okay, and yeah, our gamma of x now is going to be um, again using our exponential map, uh, starting at a point t, and now you take your velocity v and scale it by the x value, um, and that just determines how far along the geodesic the x determines how far along the geodesic you're going to travel. Okay, I should say it as if anyone has any questions about the text here. That's cool. If anyone is doing that, and and on Zoom as well, I. Feel free to, to interrupt uh, to shout out your question. I think I'll hear it, right? No, mm -hmm. um, okay. So if not, I'll keep going. So yeah, so so again, as I mentioned, the, the key thing we're going to do uh, to generalize is to generalize from the Euclidean case the least squares uh, um, estimation process. Um, and and I, you, you've seen this already when you did, uh, I understand, for shading, the, the definition of for shading on a manifold um, it is really a least squared problem, also. Um, there is a point estimate, but if, if you're but with for shading, remember, it's minimizing the sum of squares geodesic distances to your data. We're going to use the same uh, principle, and it's just a little more complicated now. Instead of minimizing the square, so here's our data yi on the manifold. And we're minimizing some of square distances, but the thing we're minimizing distance to is not a point like a crochet mean that we're looking for. It's now this whole geodesic in our regression. And, and we have to specifically match. Um, There's the, a question on the top. Oh, good. Question. Okay, I'm confused. I understand the high length of space, but where does the surface in the space come from? And does it have one global chart on it, or is it just embedded in a Euclidean space? Does it have a metric? Okay, great question. Let me back up and explain. Um, 
So the um, yeah, let's go back here. Uh, yeah, because I was being very um, abstract about what, what the space is. Um, but here I mean uh, we're on a shape space, and so this is um, something that you, you've already mathematically constructed given uh, uh, a certain a certain representation of your data that you know you have. So the example I would give, and, and the example I'll, I'll concretely use here in, in some real world examples, is think of Kindle shape space. Um, where if I give you a bunch of landmarks, um, again, you remove uh, the, the effective translation rotation scale, and that maps you onto the complex projective space, which is like a sphere, or some of it is a kind of a round metric. I mean, yes, that, that, that manifold has a metric, it has a Riemannian metric. It does not have a single global chart, and actually all of the computations you need to do, you can do uh, Avoiding charts at all together. Um, so I can compute geodesic. Like, just take a sphere, for example. Uh, compute geodesic of putting two points on the sphere just by finding the arc, the, the, the great circle arc between them. And I can ignore, you know, like the theta phi spherical coordinates. So I can avoid charts. Um, is, is If you can avoid charts, it's always good to do so. Um, and so that's the kind of thing we're working on. So if it, if it helps think about, I know I'm on a sphere and I know I need to take arcs. Uh, geodesic arcs or great circle arcs um, to, to do these geodesic computations. And, and so you might add the one, the shape space that they have frequently seen besides spheres, a polyspheres. Polyspheres, yeah, great. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. Yeah, so polyspheres is the same kind of thing. It's a, it's a, uh, a direct product of multiple spheres of different dimensions, possibly, and, and an uh, arc, you take a, a great circle arc in each component. If I remember correctly, right? <laughs> and so, so yeah, you've seen that, and in, in, it comes up in the syllable with representation. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, so in, in both of those cases, the point is you don't have to worry about an embedding space, and the reading space that you're embedded in, and you don't have to worry about charts. You're really just, um, you, you have the already a mathematical model that you understand how to do that correctly, typically. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I was, Getting a little bit too vague abstract about it. Um, okay, good. So, um, yeah, so then um, coming back to how we estimate again the slope and the intercept parameters of our geodesic progression model, um, we have, uh, you, you want to minimize the sum of square differences for my uh, output variables yi uh, to the um, position along the geodesic. That corresponds to the parameter xi, the independent uh, parameter that is attached to the yi. So um, if this were age, there's a particular point along the geodesic arc um, of that, that particular is xi, and I want it to be minimal error or, or residual from that point in my model to the point uh, that's actually observed the yi. Okay, and so this is the u squared problem. Minimize this thing, this energy. <coughs> And that gives me uh, an initial point of C hat and my manifold. And at the C hat, there's a velocity D hat, which is generated with velocity of the field. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give uh, Mark credit here, so I'm going to move the screen controls as we go in. But this was something, uh, this general strategy, GS progression, was simultaneously proposed by myself and Mark Eastheimer here. So both of the GS progression and which are here in the building. Uh, or at least we look here a little while ago. I'm still here, but um, yeah. But, okay, yeah. So this is the picture form. Um, we have uh, uh, again my pink and green manifold, um, and again the geodesic, this red curve here, is what we're trying to fit to the data. Think of that as really, really something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to optimize to get C and D to find that best fit. Um, and the error that I'm in the one function of the is uh, if, if I go to the point x i in my curve uh, along the curve, you can see the square dot of the um, I want to change the geodesic distance uh, to the actual data point y i that I've observed and minimize the point square um, geodesic distance that I have here. Okay? And the things I'm, I can do, to, to, I can change to move this geodesic curve around. I can change the point P and I can change the initial velocity P. Those are the things I'm uh, optimizing over. Okay. 
Um, now, how do you do that? So in least squares on Euclidean space, we know that I just take the derivative of that least squares problem, I put it equal to zero, and I can solve that um, just through uh, you know, a matrix uh, operation. Um, and and it's, it's in closed form, basically, um, if your matrices are invertible. Um, and so uh, for manifolds, of course, it's not that easy. Um, in that uh, objective function, I had to first of all compute the geodesic distance, but I had to compute the geodesic distance to a, geodes uh, to a geodesic. Um, and so the inside of the distance was an exponential map. Um, so I need to take a derivative, uh, a chain rule, a derivative distance, and then derivative of exponential map. Um, and how I take the derivative of exponential map is through a second order, the, the geodesics are first order, kind of minimizing length. Um, uh, the second order uh, uh, effect is called a Jacobi field. Um, and I won't, I mean, I've got the math here, or I mean, I've the notation here, but I won't um, uh, do it. I'll just show the pictures or a better way to, to, to understand the intuition because um, I can't do the math in a short period. And so, um, so what does that look like? Um, a Jacobi field is a variation of geodesics. And you can think of it as if I could vary the initial conditions, the P and the V in my geodesic, how does the geodesic vary? And so this is kind of these our two pictures we're showing. Um, uh, the, the first derivative, if you will, uh, with respect to the variation with respect to P, um, is, a, is if I vary P by V1, is it is a tangent vector, think of a tangent vector that moves P in this direction. Um, then it will move my geodesic like so. I was wondering if I was parallel translating or parallel shifting my geodesic here. Um, then I can also vary the V. So this kind of gives that finish map respect to V. Um, to be, if I move very V in this V2 direction, and I think of uh, take V and start to push it the direction in a different way, and you cause the spanning of the geodesic. That's the derivation. Okay. So these are like the, the derivatives of exponential uh, math uh, with respect to P and with respect to V. And this is how I can get gradients and optimize um, with, with these parameters and these these squares uh, model. Um, yeah, so this is the math. Um, basically, this thing, the DPF, because uh, this is the thing I'm in mind, right? And yeah, I have to take a chain rule to do the derivative of this exponential that gives me the exponential. Um, this is basically um, the Jacobi field that I'm doing here. Uh, the long map is, it turns out, the, the derivative of distance. Um, so you compute the log map, you get a vector, and then the, the vector is the input to the Jacobi field. The Jacobi field saying you move, move your initial condition so you see that by that much. So this, this is a lot of math, but um, notation, um, but the, uh, that's kind of condition we're going to want. That's how we get the gradient uh, with respect to the community here. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so we have a, um, now a, uh, uh, and we'll hand it over to now. So, uh, so yeah, we have a, a, an experiment here to, to show how the geodesic regression works. Um, this is again going to be a uh, point distribution model uh, of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is really a cross section uh, through the hemispheres um, of kind of the main highway of white matter between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. And you can see it like the MRI, it's with the right, right or white. Uh, kind of arc here, if you will. So it's really a 2D cross section of a three dimensional thing in the brain. Um, and so this is an example of that shape extracted and boundary points put on it. We get a point distribution model. Um, and we're going to use Kimball shape space with those points uh, as our manifold or shape space. Um, and this is um, a pretty small, uh, somewhat toy example. This is 32 corporate callosa. Which I think I had the squirrel right and you correct me the first time I gave it thought a long time ago. But the, the U the U and after the cork is an O. So the Pura, and I saw Pura. Ah, cool, cool. I got a new spelling. Okay. Shoot. I still don't have it right. I still don't think it is. But correct me for a second time on how to plural corpus closest one. Thank you. Um and, and one thing I'm gonna just gloss over is that when we were doing it more of point distribution models, I think. Um if you do like boundary uh, representations, you have to put them in correspondence across um, different individuals. Um, just put that in the row with using something called shape works 
um, which uh, came out of the uh, University of Utah. Um, I was involved in collaborating on some of that stuff in my previous life. Um, so anyway, that's what we have here. Um, and again, I'm going to show like the picture of all the data here. Um, and again, it, it's uh, from top to top to bottom, left to right, uh, uh, going from 20 years old to 90 years old at the very bottom uh, here. Um, you can probably see a little bit of trend. There are some linear for a Calosa as you get further down, but it's not as obvious maybe as ventricle. So there is, there is a shake up. Again, it's hard to pick up the trend just by glancing at the, a, a whole collection of shakes. But again, we can do this with um, uh, the geodesic progression now. Um, and again, you're ignoring the fact that this, this, this uh, area among those. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, so this is um, normalized uh, because of the Kendall shape space neglect size. That's right. Now that is you could put size in there, so there's size and shape spaces, which just remove translation rotation. Um, we're doing just shape, Kendall shape, which is removing volume or rotating the area. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to try. To bring up a different window so that stop sharing and reshare. To show the design Okay, so hopefully that's uh, reshared correctly. Okay, good. So this is my um, uh, flipbook animation of uh, the geodesic progression. If you want to uh, so I can control it, it easier. So, so this is the corpus callosum, and again, this is a um, a lesion corpus callosum at age twenty. So this is a it's not a real point in the data set, but the point on the geodesic that we uh, fit to the data. And so what I'm going to do is to move along age. Uh, as you'll see down there, age is twenty. See that go up. Um, but this again, you think of it as as the rotation. You're moving along the geodesic, which is an animation of uh, corpora callosa. Um, as a right? Um, so this is when we're here. I'm not going to go forward in age, and you see this is what the corpus callosum does. It acts as being about age 90 at the end. Um, and you see the basic trend is that it looks thinner uh, and more bent, right? It's a little bit fatter and a little bit straighter at the beginning. Um, and we get older with the senior and a little bit more curvature to it. Okay. Um, so that's the geodesic progression result um, on the fourth slope. And if you have to stay in this window, and that's my thought. I think this is still going to share with it. If people don't see my slides now on Zoom, I think you do, but let me know if you don't. Um, Okay. Um, so yeah, so so when we have regression, so that that's the, the estimate of the trend. Uh, of course, in statistics, what we next like to do is uh, um, ask, you know, is that trend statistically significant, right? Um, it, what's the, um, you know, uh, um, it, you know, okay, yeah, you found that the corpus callosum gets skinnier and more curved as we get older. But um, is that just a random, randomly, uh, that trend just was by random luck, or is that trend really statistically significant? And so to get to that question, because again, if you remember linear regression, uh, you can basically turn this thing into um, an F test, and we know the distribution under down consumption, and you can look it up in the, the F distribution and get the P value um, here. We have no chance of that uh, uh, in in uh, on manifolds. Um, I don't have slides for it, but just even the, the concept of a Gaussian distribution of manifolds is not um, 
uh, straightforward, but um, yeah, so, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to basically do a, a non parametric uh, test. Um, and we're going to start with um, just to understand the, the significance of this trend, uh, start with, with the R squared statistic. How do we compute an R squared statistic um, in the manifold case? Um, and so the R squared statistic, and, and the top thing I have here is uh, kind of like words, what we're computing. And if you think about the R squared statistic in just linear regression, right? It's uh, it's the um, variance along the line, if you will, that, that, that you capture the amount of, of uh, variance you capture along the line divided by your original variance with your Y data. Um, so, in some sense, it's like the proportion of the variance that your line has captured. So, you know, if, you, if your line is, is just horizontal, there's no relationship between X and Y, you get R squared zero, right? And your data lies exactly on the line, you capture all the variance by, by the line, um, your R squared is one. Right, so that's the range of our squares. The same thing in the manifold case, um, we're going to have with variance uh, of our data that is captured along the geodesic, the proportion of that in zero and one um, is what the R squared. Um, and, and what do we mean by variance? Uh, now we mean uh, just the average squared uh, distance uh, from in, in, in the, the denominator, we mean. Uh, the distance from the mean, so this is that I didn't have a line, how much variance would be in my y data, and the top is going to be, or I should say, you know, the, the top is going to be how much variance is in the geodesic, the capturing the geodesic. So the denominator is just what we would call the variance of my data. Again, it's like the Fouché variance, the variance from the Fouché mean. That's me. Yep. Um, and uh, the top part, uh, I have to be a little careful to describe. Uh, the variance along the geodesic, because remember our geodesics are um, parameterized with respect to distance along them. So the variance of just the x value times the um, uh, the norm square of the velocity v, because that captures the magnitude of how fast we move as we move along x. And so this top uh, equation here, the variance is just the x value themselves. Times the square magnitude of the v, the initial velocity, give me the variance so in terms of g that's the distance along uh, the g that's the scale. Okay, so this ratio, again, will go from 0 to 1 and will be um, again, the proportion if I'm fully on the geodesic, all my data is perfectly captured by the geodesic of 1. If my geodesic basically has a zero velocity v, it's pretty clear that I'll get a zero r squared, less than anything for. Or R squared. Okay. Um, I will mention that uh, you probably have seen R squared as one minus the variance that you don't capture, right? Like you can either say it's the variance you did capture, the proportion variance you did capture is one minus the proportion variance you don't capture, um, which is because of the Pythagorean theorem. You know, the variance you, you captured is the one leg of a right triangle, and the variance you didn't capture is the orthogonal uh, direction, um, it, it breaks down as a sum. Uh, but on, on manifold, Pythagorean theorem does that hold typically with the curvature. Um, so you can define R squared two different ways and you get two different answers, which is a little bit frustrating. So, it's, it's very fine. so I chose, I think this version um, for me uh, is more reasonable, but, but um, you know, you might choose this one. So anyway, uh, but, but anyway, so the point is, um, now, how do we get a p-value? How do we do a hypothesis test? So our hypothesis test is, you know, starting with a null hypothesis right here in the middle here. The null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between x and y, uh, and um, between, let's say, age and the shape of the corpus so there's no relationship. Um, and so we're going to do a, a non-parametric permutation test on r squared. And what does that mean to do a non uh, to do a permutation? Um, it basically means that we're going to permute the X labels. So you take your data, there's a, a list of Y values and list X values and they're paired. Now scramble the, that pairing. You scramble the order of the X's, you mismatch which one belongs to which Y. And if there's no relationship between X and Y, it shouldn't matter if you scramble the order. It's still, um, if, if there's no relationship anyway, you'll, your estimates are basically just kind of randomly uh, 
noise. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the scrambled order uh, of relationship between the x and y and compute g that's in regression every time and compute the r squared. And then the, the standard permutation trick, uh, permutation test trick, is we're going to count the number of times that those scrambled orders give me larger r squares than the true ordering of the of, of, of my data. And divide by s is the number of permutations. Okay. And of course, if there really is a relationship and null hypothesis is not really true, um, then it should be very hard to get um, a, a stronger R squared than the correct ordering of your X and Y values. And that's our value. Okay, now in the, the corpus callosum uh, experiment I just showed, um, the R squared uh, turns out to be 0.12. So, uh, and we're already between zero and one. It seems like a low number, um, but you have to remember that we have, I think, uh, 256 dimensions. So, we're in a high dimensional um, uh, shape space. Um, I should say 256 minus four for the moving translation versus the scale. So, we're 252 manifold dimensions because um, it's 128 points times two minus four for rotation, translation, and scale. Um, and uh, what that tells us is that, okay, but of those 252 dimensions, you know, trying to um, explain all the variability in biological variability of corpus callosum shape with just age, just that one dimension, you can only get about 12% of the variance. But it's, it's a lot more variance than if you pick a random dimension out of 252. So there is, there is an effect there, it's just that age can only explain with so much of the shape variability. Um, this, this is a, a statistically significant R squared. Um, if you do that test I just uh, uh, showed in the previous slide, you get a p value of under 0.01 or 0.09, 0.09, or if it's a little bit of tends to indicate that the shape is where the change is age significantly. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a geodesic regression. It's kind of like Step one is doing regression manifold. Is what is the equivalent to linear regression? Okay. Uh, any questions? Um, so I'm doing more here on any of that stuff. Okay. Um, the next thing I'll I'll talk about is um, again parametric regression, but maybe the next step beyond you know geodesic um, if we want more. Degrees of freedom in our curves. If we're in Euclidean space, the next thing we might do is polynomials. Um, and so, can we do polynomials also on the manifold um, and, and regression trends that um, don't or have a little more flexibility than just a, a geodesic curve? And so, this is an example of so the answer is yes, you can do polynomials. This is an example of, again, on the sphere. Um, what do uh, polynomials on the manifold look like? I'll, I'll talk about the math in a minute. Um, but I'll just say that the um, a zeroth order polynomial, if you will, or maybe I should call it first order polynomial. Yeah, first order polynomial is a, it's like a straight line, um, is uh, a geodesic. That's like the equator here, the black curve. Um, a quadratic curve is something uh, that you can think of like quadratics that can bend um, at least uh, to the second order. And then a bending at the second order is like a giving this a geodesic has zero curvature in the, in the manifold sense um, for a curve. Um, you can add a, a, a kind of a constant curvature uh, to your um, uh, geodesic, and that gives this quadratic, this blue curve, and then keep adding higher order um, changes, like a third order change, and you get uh, a cubic line, which is or a cubic polynomial, which is a straight curve. And so, what do these first order, second order, third order derivatives mean on a manifold? So, um, zero order is just the point you're at, so that's down to zero. First order, as we've seen, is just velocity. So we've already seen that. So by losing a first order initial condition, we have a geodesic, right? Um, I just tell you velocity. So you have to follow the geodesic equation and then move the velocity along the curve as you go. Um, second order, what happens is that I say that I, I specify that not only does the curve have this initial velocity, it has this initial second derivative. And second derivatives. On the map, are a little bit tricky. Um, so, if I take a second derivative of a tangent vector along a curve, I'm doing something called covariant derivative of that vector along the curve. Um, and essentially, 
what I'm saying here is that as you move along the curve, um, the the, uh, the tangent vector also is changing uh, with with this release. Um, this this change, uh, which I'm specifying, uh, and, and again, I have to take what's called a covariance derivative, which is like a, a derivative of a vector in a vector direction. Um, but the point is that this thing evolves uh, with if this this equation can be a k sort of polynomial. Is that the up to order k? Um, these are basically staying parallel. These derivatives really stay parallel, um, move parallel as we move along the curve. So I'm sweeping under like exactly what all this math means. So I'm hoping to give a, a little bit of intuition. Um, if you've seen covariance derivatives before, then this probably does make sense. But if you haven't, your intuition is basically uh, curvature of the second derivative, um, high order derivative. Um, but the idea that those derivatives move along the curve with you. Um, okay, so you can you can define all these things um, and they are essentially generalizing uh what it means to be a polynomial uh to the non-example. Um, but the point is that they 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 are uniquely specified these polynomials you have a case or uh polynomial is uniquely specified by um these k uh initial conditions the zero to k minus one uh, initial conditions these sort of derivatives um at, at, at time zero. It looks like the geodesic is zero order initial condition and a first order initial condition specifies all you need to know about the geodesic. The polynomial is specified by you know maybe an entire order initial condition at time zero. And then the evolution equation that we have here is is good to go with an overview of the initial condition. Okay. Um I'm gonna skip this. Oh no, I'm not going to stick it. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, but, uh, this gets really ugly. Uh, but I think you know the, the point is that um, we have. Uh, I'll tell you what it means. We have the same uh, um, uh, kind of least square problem. So now gamma is a polynomial curve. I'm trying to minimize the least square distances um, uh, with polynomial curve. These equations are, are, are kind of ugly, but basically what they're saying is that we need to match um, the initial conditions of the, of the polynomial. Um, and so uh, this is basically, these are like Lagrange multipliers, these lambdas um, that say these are the initial conditions. That the first derivative is E1, second derivative, or the i derivative is E i plus 1, um, and then the first derivative is E to the 0. Um, these are all just um, these conditions are here, um, but you have to write them out as the usual the branch multiplier trick that you do in the calculator to put one of those constraints uh, into the model. So it looks, it looks pretty nasty, though it's, it's really just the polynomial um, equation. Um, and you can solve this. Uh, and, and again, the, the specific details of the equation are not that important. I just want to uh, explain in computer what's going on here is that I, there, you get these things called advent equations, which you can think of like back propagation uh, of the gradient. Like if I can do the one back propagation through a you know a neural network, we're now doing back propagation along the, the polynomial. So you, you get um, again the, the residual, right? The, the distance between or the geodesic between your model between the curve and the data point, and you need to back propagate that to the gradient at the initial condition. And that's what this adjoint equation does. Um, you, you solve this backwards in time, back to time zero, and that gives you this update to your initial condition. Um, and the point is, um, uh, again, without explaining all the math, this term here, which you're, you're integrating backwards, this capital R is the Riemannian curvature tensor. So um, it's doing the Riemannian geometry, um, and in order to get to the Riemannian curvature tensor, it's basically. Um, uh, this, this higher order tensor that, that tells you the curvature of the manifold, and that's what we need to do in the compute. It's actually, this is hard to do for a lot of manifolds, but for things like spheres, they have constant curvature. You know, the curvature is just for the unit sphere, just one, and so for, no matter what dimension you have, um, it, 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 it is tractable to compute this thing. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm glossing over a lot of those. I have the equations here, I'm glossing over the exact details. Of um, but, but hopefully, the sense of what we're doing. Um, so yeah, so then this is the full explosion again, the same data set. Um, and and now what we see is we're doing uh, uh, so we're doing uh, k 
polynomial regression on again simple shape space that we still disclose them as a function of age. And um, we're looking at uh, you know geodesic as first order, uh, quadratic adding a second order effect there, and then cubic adding a second and third order um, uh, initial condition. And and going from top to bottom, uh, we have uh, geodesic, uh, quadratic, cubic, and uh, the color coded um, uh, sort of yellows and purples with the uh, you know, laser scan everywhere. Um, so. Um, you get uh, this is what we saw before for yellow, it was a fabric for disclosure, and you get stinger. Um, uh, quadratic, you can kind of see that a little bit more bending goes up. Um, and the cubic, uh, it, it's hard to tell from this the color scheme compared to the animation. Um, again, just the, the bending, you, you still get the thinning, but you get a little bit uh, more complex bending type uh, changes happening. What's interesting, it turned out, um, is that uh, if you look at this picture here, um, these are the initial conditions if I plot them into shape itself, so we'll take the time zero shape. Um, the uh, blue and red uh, and black is the first order velocity. Um, the red is where I don't see the color. So it's blue, it's quadratic, the second order. And then red is the um, third order. And this is how age evolves. Uh, sorry, this is how the parameterization along the geodesic evolves. If I move on to the first order of geodesic um, as I change the age. So, what we see is because these are actually denoted, they're all parallel to each other, all these velocities. Um, what actually happens is that this uh, looks very close to the same animation I showed you, just reparameterized in time. So um, we know if we age, right, we go through phases of in early on, before this time scale, you, know, you go through growth first if you're a little kid, um, as you're getting older, you go through um, uh, changes more rapidly at certain ages than others. And um, that's what we're seeing uh, in the corpus callosum is that a geodesic model, the thing that's limiting about it is not the shape changes in model, but the uh, changes in rates of that shape change. So the, the, the general shape change we saw is how it um, does capture how shape changes as you get older, but it doesn't capture the more non-linearity in the rate of change. So that, that should sped up and slow down at different ages. Um, you see the, the, the cubic really speeds up later in life, uh, this sort of in the degenerative they would hear um, the, the shape changes uh, speed up. Um, and so, yeah, so if you add these higher order uh, models, uh, uh, terms, that um, rate of change, that sort of reparameterizing the, the, the constant speed geodesic um, gives you a better fit to what's happening uh, in the brain. But you really need the third order to really see that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a good point. The second order does a little bit, uh, and you see again, as you get older, it, it starts to affect a little bit more. But yeah, the real acceleration that you get at the end shows up best once you get to see it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, I don't know if you went to quadratic. You also have to worry about overfitting, I'll just make it clear. Um, just like in linear regression, if I did. You can do like polynomial, like x, x squared, x cubed. You can keep going off to whatever order polynomial you want, but you're overfitting data at some point. Uh, just be uh, kind of careful about that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and then my right to accelerate, in principle, the acceleration argument mm -hmm. would already apply to the quadratic. Even uh, that, that, yeah, no, the acceleration does come up in quadratic. It's, it's, it's just that you have a very, like, you think of a computer, really, it's, it's a one dimensional acceleration because you're constrained in parallel to the original geodesic on We really are just taking a line and saying, now move along the geodesic, but at quadratic speed, right? And so, um, quadratic is still pretty limited, like, you can only, like, if I can only fit a like, quadratic, right? Um, I would have to have acceleration that did exactly what a quadratic can do, right? So the I think what's going on with the, the cubic is that if you want to be slow and then and then change it at the end, you can put that better to smooth at least again 
story was done that time. Okay, so then the last thing on uh, regression I want to talk about might be example or is it for voice bias or something? Um, is is now non parametric. Uh, so non parametric regression. Um, what we're doing when again I should say this specifically again this is again for the univariate data what it looks like um, is is this what's called non Ryan Watson or kernel regression is that um, your f of t which is again the function for some reason I'm just confused here is that um, uh, I don't see really much taking that thing with t and so anyway t is the last common x before it's just it's the um, the independent variable um, and it really is in our our case means time so it doesn't have to be but what your your uh, function is going to look like f t uh, which you want your y to be modeled as is really just a weighted average of your y uh, samples. Uh, and again, in the Euclidean space, that means just weighting them and summing them up. That's the weighted average. Okay. Um, and, and the way we want to weight our um, samples is in some kernel function, which is um, uh, dependent on t. And so the idea is, as I think you will know, like a, a window function, right, is going to be um, I, like a Gaussian, let's call it uh, at t. At, at the point we're centered at in T, and then you want to downweight things to get further away from that center point. And and this is divided by the sum is just normalize the things to the atom one. That's the way and you just weight it out you want to add a solution to add So this is what it looks like um for the pictures, uh, a weighting function or curl K uh could be something like Gaussian, where if I want to evaluate the regression function of some T, I um will weight. My data, if you know how far it is uh, in a T from this uh, center point, with T. Okay, so that's what this weighting function looks like. Um, and this is, um, I, if you go back to the picture I had of, of the, the MRI uh, axial slices, this is that data again. Um, but now what we're doing is that we're just extracting the gray matter volume out of this MRI, this GD MRI. Um, and uh, this is plotting it as a function of age, and you can kind of see what the trend is. This is depressing part of again. I guess it's also supposed to be depressing. We're losing uh, you know, brain matter as you get older. Um, so that's the depressing part of the, the lecture. Um, and uh, this is the kernel regression. This one almost looks like you do a linear regression to get this result, but um, yeah, this is the kernel regression. Um, uh, uh, here. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's what it looks like in Euclidean space. Uh, I should mention this is the work of Brad Davis. Um, uh, and and again, I, I was a co-author of the EQ at UNC. I did this work. I'm working with Tom Vichy. Um, and one of the best people more than I did way back a long time ago, two months ago. Um, and so yeah, so then how do we do this on manifolds? Uh, we're going to do, again, weighted averages on manifolds. But we're going to do it with the Perche principle of averaging, where we take these squares, um, uh, the geodesic distances. And, and the, 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 the difference now is with Perche, we get these some square distances, but now we're going to do all we have to do is throw in this weight function that we saw before based on where you are in time um, and uh, look at the distance uh, to the yi uh, data point. Um, it gives a utility I weight. Again, you know, where I'm going to evaluate this function in the T, this point I'm evaluating from a regression curve. And then this is where a weighted average looks like. And, but again, it's a minimization problem where a weighted averaging in Euclidean space is just summing up, multiplying by the weight is summing up. So now we have to do an optimization again to do this in a minimization. Okay? Um, again, the cartoon is we're going to get a continuous curve on a manifold, have to do our data. And we're, we're evaluating at this peak time point. Again, that's a continuous value that I want to evaluate the curve. Um, I just need to compute the average of for nearby points with similar t values and weighted by the correct weighting function. Oh, yeah. So then that's where I have my uh, picture of what that looks like. The video, I should say. Um, Background. Uh, 
Let me share the screen with them for zoomers. Okay, hopefully. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be, I should mention now, now I'm using digital that now the shape space is, is getting more of an image registration and we're building essentially an average atlas. Uh, we're performing in our, our geodesics are performing uh, with images um, uh, from the original to a template or average that we can see um, here. And uh, you're going to see um, the change in uh, the average brain. Uh, these are um, all the female persistence in this study, we just look at um, one step at a time to um, establish the age uh, variability. Um, these are all the female uh, persistence in the aging study going from 20 to um, 80. Uh, you can see uh, the changing brain, as Steve pointed out. The biggest change is you can see the picture get larger. There's a little bit of an edge effect, which I think is just because the window dies off and you have fewer samples, but the ventricles look like they get smaller, right? The ventricles are the black. Yeah, sorry. I think, yeah, the ventricles are the black regions in the center uh, of the of the there. And if you don't know about ventricles, they are silver spinal fluid. Okay. And so you're you're not gaining uh C, gaining CSF is not a good thing in this case because. Um, it means you're losing volume elsewhere, right? You're losing white matter, gray matter, both of gray matter. Um, and uh, and yeah, the, your skull doesn't shrink. Your, the overall one has to stay the same, roughly, so you can get um, larger ventricles taking up the space that you lost. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell from the visual and the contrast mechanism, but you, there, there are also gray matter um, reduction. Uh, so in the cortex and structure of the structure, but it's hard to see just from a, a slide. Um, okay, so that's so uh, that's basically a two equivalent thing. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're losing transistors. Uh, you can see there. Yeah. Oh, let me uh, again, let me share. That wraps up the, um, the question. I have one more topic I'm going to see in really quickly in the last five minutes or so. Um, it's really also a sort of progression, but uh, just a little more to it. Um, uh, and this is longitudinal shape analysis. So, so the person I've talked about so far is you know, the cross sectional study that has one snapshot in time for each. Participant in the study. Longitudinal studies would take a participant and track that participant over time. The same individual would come back and be measured in the RK, usually MRI or some kind of imaging uh, time at, at, at multiple times to see how they're progressing. Um, and you do that with lots of participants. Um, and so uh, I like to always, uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to stick to Carter Slocum. <laughs> Uh, the focus was them uh, in Oasis. We have a longitudinal uh, Oasis data. And um, we want to know okay, so yeah, so in this picture, um, I have uh, just here, I have 70 subjects each row of the subject, and they're imaged at three different components C1, C2, C3. So instead of just three images for three people, I have nine images for the three images for her. Um, and uh, we have, again, a kind of small, smaller study here to, to demonstrate sort of where, how to do this again in shape spaces. Um, but in this study, we have 11 healthy subjects, 12 subjects with dementia, and they have three um, uh, total scans each, and that's about two years apart, or, so, or I guess, yeah, or three years apart, but with six years time window, uh, roughly, not exactly the same. Okay. Um, and what we want to know now is so the regression model we've seen, like that corpus locus getting skinnier and bending. What we could say there is that this is what the average corpus locus looks like over time, but it doesn't actually tell us what any one particular individual experiences over time. Um, and so I'd like to show um, this picture 
uh, which again is confirmed, but a for example, this does happen in real data, this is a cartoon here with every sample. Um, it's why you want to do um, longitudinal things, and it's related to the genome symptom paradox. Um, you know, like grouping data can give you different answers than if you look at the data all as one big thing. So in this case, you might look at this data and say, well, there's not much trend, or maybe there's a trend going down uh, of the three bits by using the data versus the, the time variable. Um, but if I group it, so yeah, this is this actually is a trend, a linear uh, trend. But if I group it and um, say these are different individuals, um, all the individuals are going the opposite direction. They're actually all going up, but you wouldn't see that if I didn't show you the grouping of two to two. And the average individual trend, if I think these trends hit into individuals and then average the trend, would be this red line. And so you get a completely different answer if you take into account that follow up um, in the longitudinal. Uh, data. Um, and this does happen in, in, real, in, in, in real world uh, data in different types of effects. Um, okay, and so very quickly, um, what we're going to do now to do to, to analyze this type of, type of data is we're going to look at longitudinal regression models uh, on, on shape based on manifolds. And um, the idea here is that I want to think of this as there is an average trend, but it's an average trend that individuals would go, uh, would have, and each individual is a perturbation of that trend. And so the average trend in our case is going to be a, as we mentioned, this is called a hierarchical geologic model, it's hierarchical because you have this average geodesic, that's a blue curve, again, parameters by a Michigan version uh, for this in velocity, I'm calling it now alpha beta. Um, and then these individuals, which have different little cartoon symbols uh, for their data points, um, are going to be just perturbations of this uh, blue geodesic to be used as a way to look for individuals. And they have their own position of velocity, but the position of velocity is a perturbation like that. Um, okay. And so to do this, we have to take a let me go back here. We have to actually model that perturbation. So we're taking this initial condition, perturbing it to give you these different individuals. Um, this turns out to be very um, uh, difficult to do on, on general manifolds. Um, I'm perturbing a point is moving along a geodesic, but how do you perturb um, the tangent vector or the whole geodesic along with it? Um, it's a little bit tricky. Um, and what we uh, did uh, is, is use this thing called the Sasaki metric. Um, it's a metric between uh, on the tangent bundle, so on pairs of points and their velocities. So the initial conditions of the geodesic, I can talk about um, geodesic distance between the pair, point and, and velocity pairs. Um, so the DS is the Sasaki distance, the Sasaki metric is, is in between pairs, position, velocity, point, velocity. Uh, um, and this is a this is an actual real computation of the ge geodesic on the Sasaki uh, using the Sasaki metric. So I give you an initial position T with velocity U on the sphere and uh, in point position T2 and in velocity U2. Um, you're now taking a geodesic uh, in position and velocity, and this is this type of case. It's a little hard to tell from the picture, but this is not a geodesic. This black line is not a geodesic on the sphere. So if you if you have to say that's the curvature field, it's not a it's not a great curvature. Um, so so the difference in the uh, velocities change what the optimal um, kind of trajectory is in the field. But this this whole thing does minimize a Riemannian metric on the tangent symbol. But um, again, the math is all can't be explained in thirty seconds. So I'll help with it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so the bottom line uh, in this uh, longitudinal analysis for the corpus callosum, um, which is set up, I mentioned at the beginning about uh, 11 and 12 uh, healthy versus dementia subjects in the original longitudinal study. Um, what we get is an average trend, um, a longitudinal model uh, for the healthy group and for the dementia group. Um, and the way I'm displaying it now is I'm displaying time zero as the black gray behind here, and then the time six years later um, is the red curve. This is moving along the geodesic, again, the, uh, that, that blue, blue geodesic, average geodesic of this, of this longitudinal trend. Um, is the end of that geodesic is the red, and this is for the um, 
subject to or something, otherwise healthy. Um, and this is the subject uh, with the nature group. Um, and you can see that the trend uh, is quite different. Um, there's more spinning. You can see this is a little bit, the rate is a little bit thinner than the rate up here. And the, uh, the bending happens, or, or straightening rather, um, happens here with a less bending to the uh, um, aspect that we did there. Um, what's not obvious in the plot there, yeah, when it's black, I'll just describe it, is that the black and gray curves are not that different. So that time zero, the average for the person is actually not that different. Um, and again, we can do a similar kind of permutation test uh, for significance. We have long been the details. But what you can see is that the C value for the intersect differences between healthy and dementia are uh, not significant, but the, the differences are there in the split. So you do have this degenerating faster in the dementia uh, trend than in the, the healthy trend. Okay, so that's kind of the last thing I will talk about. I have one topic just in case I went fast because I didn't think I'd get to, but that's exactly what I'm going to get to. I'll stop and see if there's any last questions. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about it, but basically medians come from the L1 known rather than the L2. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, questions, first of all. So it would be okay if I take the, the PDF and put it on my Google site so that yeah, we can get at it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you, Tom, very much. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. You want me to send me the link to what? Where to put it? Yeah, yeah, put it in there.